Next, from the City Club of Chicago, Illinois Comptroller Susanna Mendoza talks about the recent financial crisis in the budget standoff and how she is adding greater transparency to the financial reporting of information in order to have better financial controls for the state going forward. This runs about 50 minutes. Now I want to thank you all so much for coming here today to hear a little bit about my success, our success as an office, um, and the ability for our office to be able to open up a window of transparency that gives Illinois citizens a look into their state finances in a way that they've never had before. Mm -hmm. And I want to spend some time sharing a little bit about my vision for the Office of Controller. Now perhaps you've heard a few of the changes that we've succeeded in making in state government. We passed four major transparency reform bills, cut the Office of the Controller's budget, helped end the budget impasse, brought down the interest rate that we were paying on so much debt, calmed the markets, and that's not even counting my weekend crime fighting. Uh, you can Google that. <laughs> Now today's message I hope will be an uplifting one because I've seen firsthand that there is still bipartisanship in Springfield. Now all of my transparency reform bills, all of them passed unanimously or near unanimously. Now that doesn't happen if you're busy pursuing only a one party solution. Now I've been known on occasion to offer some criticism of the governor. <laughs> I mean, no, seriously, I have. Yeah. Uh, but that's not partisan. I criticize him because Governor Rauner has failed our state. I helped lead the impeachment effort of former Governor Rod Blagojevich. And I did that after having first been an outspoken critic of his before it was popular to criticize a governor of my own party. Now, I just refuse to suffer bad governors silently regardless of their party. So it's, you know, equal equal uh, attack if I need to do that. Now I dedicate myself to working in a bipartisan fashion though, and I pride myself on building relationships that cross party lines. Many legislators remember me for being one of the most bipartisan legislators that they served with when I was a House member, and I served 10 years in the Illinois House of Representatives before going on to become Chicago City Clerk. Now it's why I was such good friends with the late Judy Bartopinka, who's office, I have the honor and the privilege of finishing out the remaining two years of her term. Now that's how you get every Republican legislator to stand up with you and support initiatives that help move the state forward. It's how you get them to stick with you to override vetoes of your bills. My transparency revolution that I am so excited to talk about today is bipartisan, and I'm super proud of it. Now before I go much further, I have a few people I do want to thank in addition to thanking all of you for coming here today. I have a great staff of people who work an insane amount of hours. So for those of you guys who never get the credit but make me look good, please stand up right now. And I'd like you, the crowd, to please give them a round of applause. Stand up, guys. They're awesome. These, mo these folks have helped me make the kind of changes in state government that our critics said we would be unable to do. And my husband, David, I mean, what can I say about David? I, I started off with this, but being the spouse and an elected official is one of the hardest and most thankless jobs or roles that there is. However, his unwavering support it inspires me every day, and it's the key ingredient to my success. I really, truly couldn't most importantly, I wouldn't want to do this without him. Thank you so much, honey, for your dedication to our family and to my ability to serve the state. We're in it together. Yes. Okay, so now on to state finances. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! All right, on the bright side, we're no longer careening down the path of double downgrades that we suffered through during the worst part of the budget impasse. We've come to rest now on the cliff above the molten lava of junk bond status. <laughs> and for the moment, uh, we are holding our own. We have a consensus budget, thank God. 
Now it's far from perfect. The last estimate of this consensus budget is about $1.2 billion out of WEC. Now that's not as bad as the ones that had previously been proposed, uh, some of which were $3 billion or more out of balance, but they still insist, they still insist on counting savings from things like the sale of the Thompson Center, which anybody in here actually think Thompson Center selling? I'll sell it to you if you think so, right? So, you know, I, I, I don't get why this is just like they, they don't even pretend. But in any, in any event, this imperfect budget beats no budget. And that's the key thing to remember. Now, when I took office in the depths of the budget impasse, I found myself in a position that the controller was never meant to be in. And that's making life or death decisions about who gets paid now and whose payments have to wait. And when I say life and death decisions, I, I mean it literally. Some people, it's an issue of will they be disconnected from their life-saving treatments. For other businesses, it's will their business survive the ability to continue without being able to make their payrolls, right? This is life and death in two different environments, a physical one and a business one. And that's because the state still doesn't have enough money to pay all of its bills. Those of you who heard me here a year and a half ago might remember me saying that being the controller of the state of Illinois feels a little bit like being Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life, right? Where everybody wants their money, but I can't give them all their money. And I say, I know I owe you this, but I can't give you all this. What can you get by? And what can I give you that'll get you through the next two weeks? That continues to be the case in this role. And I did say at the time that I wanted to stop Governor Rauner from turning Illinois into Pottersville. Well, I wouldn't say we've turned Illinois from Pottersville into Shangri-La by any stretch of the imagination. <coughs> Excuse me. But we have progressed from Pottersville to purgatory and uh, still paying for the sins of the past few years of no budget and previous years of less than ideal budgets. I still have to make life or death decisions that the controller, frankly, should not have to be making. Now, even as the governor has dismissed the downgrades that the budget impasse brought on by saying, who cares what Wall Street thinks? Don't listen to Wall Street. You've heard me go out of my way to calm the markets and assure them that even through the worst of the crisis, Illinois will make its monthly debt service payments, and we sure as hell won't skip any payments on my watch. That's a certain path to a downgrade, and someone's got to be the adult in the room. It turns out it's me. Now, my message to the investor community has been clear. Illinois remains a sound investment. And they have responded to my message. Gabe Petek, the Illinois credit analyst for the bond rating firm S&P, told Governing Magazine that it was comforting that during the budget standoff, I consistently reiterated that the debt service would be funded. He also said that my advocacy for the Debt Transparency Act helped state officials and the public better understand how much Illinois actually owed in unpaid bills. I'll get to the Debt Transparency Act in just a minute. Now, when I got to Springfield, the General Assembly was holding appropriations hearings. They were asking the governor's department heads and agency directors what cuts they were willing to make in their budgets. Not a single one of them offered up a single cut. Now, I wasn't shy. I have a record of leading by example on budget cutting. In the city clerk's office, I cut overtime spending by more than 70% and reduced my payroll by more than 10%, saving Chicago taxpayers millions. So I went into my appropriation hearing and said, even though you're not asking me, I'm going to voluntarily cut my own budget by 10%. I presented the lowest proposed budget for the Office of the Controller in 20 years. I managed my budget so well that I returned a million dollars to the Treasury. Even during the worst fiscal crisis in the history of the state of Illinois, when the Controller's office was being asked to do more than ever before, I said, we're going to do more with less. And we've done exactly that. When I took office in December, <laughs> When I took office in December of 2016, the bills that were owed to hospice centers were six months behind. These are folks at their end, right? They deserve dignity at the end. Some nursing homes were on the verge of closing because the state had not paid them in so very long. State payments for special education students were running nearly half a year behind. And while schools were going without funding and social service agencies were closing their doors, my predecessor 
quietly transferred $70 million out of the general revenue fund just four days before taking office to pay for high-priced consultants. Now, I quickly rearranged the priorities to make sure that the state's most vulnerable come first. When I was running for controller, I promised to move the employee bonuses that politically connected employees got just before election day, very coincidentally, right? to the back of the line for payment moving forward in Illinois. Now the incumbent that I was running against at the time said that this just couldn't be done and I just must not understand how the controller's office works. Well, let me tell you something. It was so hard that I got it done on my first day on the job. <laughs> back of the line. So how did the state get into this mess that we're in right now? Uh, in large part, look, the governor campaigned for office on lowering the state income tax, which did happen, but blowing a $5 billion hole into the operating budget. Now, he never made the $5 billion worth of cuts in the state budget to go along with that $5 billion cut in revenues. It's math. When Governor Rauner took office four years ago, he inherited a stack of $5 billion in unpaid bills. And that's a mess, and he deserves no blame for that. He inherited a mess, $5 billion. But did he cut his agency budgets in the process and tighten things up? No, his agencies didn't purchase one less paperclip. In fact, he went on to become the highest, uh, the, the governor with the highest level of deficit spending in the history of the state of Illinois. And that's not my personal opinion. The numbers tell the story, and those numbers don't lie. Now, in just two and a half years, he grew that backlog of unpaid bills from $5 billion to $16.7 billion. Just two and a half years. He owns that. Now, I've learned a lot of interesting things about how this state works since I took office. Even after 10 years in the legislature, there were things that I frankly did not know. Years ago, the state passed a law that was designed to prevent bureaucrats from letting unpaid bills sit on their desks for too long. It said that if the state went more than 90 days without paying a bill, that the state would pay a penalty of one percentage point a month on certain bills. Now, that may have seemed like a good idea at the time, but when you have the level of unpaid bills that have been racked up under this administration, that meant that the state was now on the hook for 12% interest a year. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a little bit of asthma. <clears throat> Hold it tight here. <clears throat> this stuff will take your breath away, you know what I mean? <sighs> <clears throat> Thank you, Jay. So um, a year ago, legislators of both parties were able to pass a budget, but the governor once again vetoed it, and that set the stage for a third year now without a budget. Now, I met with legislators of both parties, and I outlined in very stark detail the consequences of what would be a third year without a budget and the, dissent <clears throat> and the state's descent into junk bond status. Now, I released a video also that went viral, really not thinking that very many people would watch it, but 2.8 million views over the next two days let us know that something struck a chord with Illinoisans and they got to making phone calls, and they put pressure on their legislators and on the governor and on the leaders to get the job done. Republican and Democratic legislators did come together finally, and they overrode the governor's veto, and we were able to finally breathe and have a budget. Now, that budget included authorization that I fought for to let the governor issue $6 billion worth of bonds. That would be utilized to pay off the state debt. Can you believe this guy fought me on that? Ugh. <laughs> All right, so look. Crazy being what it was, I had to launch a statewide tour to make the case to civic groups, to editorial boards, to clubs like this one, that this was in household terms similar to refinancing your home. Lawrence Massal, thank you. Because folks like the Civic Federation and others said this makes sense. It's going to save the state of Illinois billions of dollars. It doesn't make sense not to move forward. This is not borrowing for the sake of borrowing. Keep in mind that every day that went by without going to the market on this deal was costing taxpayers $2 million a day in additional late payment interest penalties. The concept of 
And in home, in home terms of refinancing your mortgage, if you're paying 12% today, you could pay 3.5%. Who would take that deal? Show of hands? Nobody would take that deal? I mean, geez, who am I talking to? Yeah, it's a great deal. <clears throat> so after two months of delayed action and at a cost of $122 million in additional late payment interest penalties, the governor finally agreed to the refinancing. So we attacked the highest interest accruing debt first. As we paid down billions of dollars of Medicaid debt, we got federal matching funds, so we were able to pay down even more debt. We brought the backlog of bills down from $16.7 billion to what is today $7.3 billion. We're still not out of the woods, you know, but we can begin to see some light between the trees. This is a huge step forward for Illinois. And that lower interest rate of 3.5%, that lower interest rate is going to save taxpayers a net four to six billion dollars over the life of that deal. It was a great deal for taxpayers. And I just want to thank every editorial board, every newspaper reporter who wrote about this, every civic leader who chimed in and said, let's get this deal done because Illinois can't afford any more additional stupid debt. Now, see, here's another thing that you probably didn't know about the state government, and that is that the controller, while I am the state's chief fiscal officer, did you have any idea that the state's chief fiscal officer couldn't see over half of the state's liabilities? Does that make any sense? The person responsible for managing the state's finances couldn't see the extent of the state's bills. Let that sink in for a second, right? I mean, Father Steve, you look like you're going to start praying right now. <laughs> no, please, pray, 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 yes. You know, last year I went to bed thinking that the bill backlog was $13 billion, only to wake up and find out that it wasn't $13 billion, it was $14 billion. Overnight, boosh, just like that. How does that happen? Well, here's how. When the Department of Health and Family Services sends over a billion dollars worth of bills to me uh, that have been sitting on their desk for almost an entire year, that's how that happens, overnight, just like that. Hiding bills, it's crazy. But this is how the state of Illinois has been run for all of these years. Now, my office has to plan and cash manage to make sure that we're making those required monthly payments to our bondholders, to the pension funds, to schools. It doesn't help to have a surprise batch of a billion dollars of bills that I didn't even know existed dropped on my lap. Could you run your businesses like that? So I drafted the Debt Transparency Act, which requires state agencies to report to my office every month now the amount of unpaid bills that they're sitting on, whether any late payment interest penalties are owed on those bills, and whether the legislature authorized those bills, or is this in fact deficit spending? Now all of that seems pretty common sense, and all the legislators I talked to were really surprised that my office already didn't have that information. They just assumed we did. And they understood why this new legislation was so critically important to the state's finances. Now it turned out that the only requirement that agencies had up to that point was to report debt once a year on a single sheet of paper. It was a total number of what the total liabilities were sitting at the entirety of the governor's state agencies. It told me nothing. And that number, by the way, was only current, even though I got it in October, as of June 30th of the prior year. So I talked to every single legislator. I worked so hard on really educating the legislature about this issue, and my bill passed with bipartisan majorities in both houses. The governor, though, surprised a lot of people by vetoing the bill, saying that it would be burdensome. Now, thankfully, nobody was buying that, and I traveled the state talking to legislators, to editorial boards, all of whom endorsed an override of the governor's veto. And for the first time in the history of the state of Illinois, the House of Representatives overrode a governor's veto unanimously. First time ever, yeah. <clears throat> and you know, it's hard to overestimate, uh, or over, I should say it's hard to overstate, really, the importance of what the Debt Transparency Act means for the state's finances. It truly is the largest fiscal transparency reform in the history of our state. And I didn't realize, just like I said, like many other legislators, that we didn't have this visibility. But how can you possibly even begin to draft real budgets if you're not using real numbers? Or your numbers are almost a year old. So this year, for the first time, legislators had current numbers as they worked with each other and the governor's office to draft the consensus budget that was passed. I am so proud of that. My office, my team was so amazing in getting that done. 
that is going to change the course of where our state's finances are going to go for the future of this state. And while it may not seem like a big sexy thing to talk about, let me tell you, if you're into saving money for the state of Illinois, this is about the coolest thing that happened this whole legislative session. <laughs> Now, for you numbers nerds out there, you can read our monthly debt transparency report. Uh, every month, you can read it every day. We have all of our reports starting from January. We put out a monthly report that's available to the public. It's available to the press. We want you to know how your tax dollars are being spent. My office is inspired to be the most transparent controller's office in the country, and we want to make sure that we are the most trusted source of government numbers when it comes to people who want to know how the money is being spent. So please go check it out on our new revamped website, IllinoisController.gov. And now, thanks to that Debt Transparency Act, we finally have an answer to the question of how much that two-year budget impasse cost us. All the state agencies had to report to me how many old bills they were sitting on and how much in late payment interest penalties was owed on them. And over the course of those two years, we now know that Illinois racked up over $1 billion in late payment interest penalties. Now that's a billion dollars that will never go to Illinois schools, to home care for the elderly, college scholarships, business development, pension, or tax relief. One billion dollars flushed down the drain. And that just happened in two years. And to put it in perspective, it took four different governors and 18 years prior to this administration to hit the one billion dollar mark in late payment interest penalties. Illinois has had late payment interest penalties in the past, but never to the degree or the scale that we see today. Now, you know how governors budget, though, to pay back those late payment interest penalties? They don't. But starting this year, they're going to have to, because guess what? We passed the Budgeting for Debt Act, which was sponsored by Republican Representative Dave McSweeney. And it requires that future governors spell out in their budgets that those liabilities exist and how they plan to pay back those interest penalties. And if you think that it's pretty rare that a Democratic statewide office holder would ask a Republican legislator to sponsor one of her key bills, you're right, it is unusual, but I want all of my bills to have bipartisan support. This bill requiring governors to budget for interest penalties passed unanimously in both houses. And that's because being fiscally smart and caring about finances should not be a Democratic or a Republican thing. It should be a good citizen thing. <laughs> There's just two more things I want to talk about with that respect and two more transparency bills that we were able to pass. Are you familiar with the concept of offshoring? Jackie, I'm putting you on the spot. I'm sorry, I was See, thanks for paying attention. Way to go. Yeah. All right. You're fired. Get out of here. Right. So in Illinois state government, it refers offshoring, refers to the way that governors mask the size of their budgets by taking employee salaries from other agencies. So essentially they're hiding the truth from the public. The governor, for example, says he has 47 employees and a $5 million payroll. He actually has 110 employees and a $10 million budget. But he offshores 63 of those employees into other agencies or takes the money from other agencies. Now, for instance, he'll take a quarter of a million dollars to pay for an education czar, but the money will be coming out of the Department of Health and Human Services to be paid for an education czar that has nothing to do with health and human services. At the same time, at the same time that the money that's supposed to go to health and human services for autism programs gets cut. So you might recall that the governor announced that he was cutting autism funding on World Autism Day, but at the same time, what you didn't know was that the money that was in that fund was then utilized to pay for an education czar that had nothing to do with education and report, I mean, with nothing to do with uh, autism and reported directly to the governor. So the bill is really simple. It says, look, if you work for the governor, you must be paid from the governor's payroll. Makes sense, right? Who here doesn't think that makes sense? All right, it makes sense. <clears throat> no more rating of government agencies for resources to fund your own staff. Governors should present honest budgets. I don't care if that's a Democrat or a Republican. It's not your money. It's the people's money, and you need to be honest about it. Now, to be fair, this deceptive practice was not unique to Governor Rauner. Every single governor, as far back as we could tell, 
has been utilizing this deceptive practice, Democrats and Republicans. But it was wrong when Governor Quinn did it. It was wrong with, when Governor Blagojevich did it. It was wrong when Governor Ryan did it. And it's still wrong when Governor Rauner does it. We're ending it. And I'm proud of that, too. <clears throat> And not only did every Republican and Democratic legislator in the House of Representatives vote for that, but Governor Rauner signed it. So see, there is hope. <laughs> there is. And signing my bill made the governor feel so good that this year he signed all of my bills in my legislative packet. So again, you know, hope is eternal. So the, the last budget transparency bill of mine that he signed this year will let us know a little bit more about the folks that step in and lend money to the businesses around Illinois that the state is late in paying. The vendor payment program it was started by the governor's office and it pays a pretty good interest rate, 12%, to lenders that upfront the money for state businesses that are waiting for payments from the state. So you know that during the 736 day budget impasse, so many businesses went under and many only survived because they were able to access capital from the marketplace that the state wasn't paying them for services already rendered. It was just so wrong and so anti-business to have a 736-day crisis like this. Now, having said that, the advantage of the practice is that it does allow the businesses to function. The downside, though, is that we don't really have any idea who's behind these third-party lenders, where they get their financing. Nothing. This bill will fix that. We're about to learn a lot more about the qualified purchasers that are making money off of the state's inability to pay its bills. We have a billion dollar program that's going unregulated. Those days are over. So moving forward, and this bill did pass and it was signed, we will now be able to know who there's disclosure requirements as well as auditing requirements of this program that really centers around a great deal of taxpayer money. So that's pretty much a small taste. I mean, I know it's like finances are never super exciting, right? People don't like, yeah, we're going to go listen to the controller speak today about <laughs> transparency. Thanks for being here. You get extra credit points, big time. But, uh, but um, there's more. I mean, if you think, like, think of all the things we just talked about. We did all of that in a year and a half. I, I have the ability to see far down the road and want to do great things. And if you think that we've gotten a lot done, you haven't seen anything yet. When I was Chicago City Clerk, plenty of people warned me that I would never succeed in switching from one month a year city sticker sales with long lines, three to four hour long lines, to a year round sales system that saved the city four and a half million dollars in its first year and every year since then. Most importantly, we got rid of those three to four hour long lines. People got their lives back on that day that they'd have to go waste it. Now, I've proven a, I have a proven track record of getting things done and in implementing technology upgrades. The upgrades that we are undertaking, which many of you have already begun to see on our revamped website, they're going to make you appreciate even more the once obscure office of the controller of Illinois. Now, the office responsible for putting out all of the state's paychecks is modernizing its technology infrastructure. And we will be a model of payroll and accounting innovation. I'd like the office to be looked at as the best government source for numbers and predictive modeling, setting the tone and the policies for discussions about state finance and budget, learning from the mistakes of the past so we can chart the most responsible course forward. The transparency revolution that we have brought to the state budget, actual numbers that you, the taxpayers of, Illinois, of Illinois can actually see and trust empowers you, the taxpayer, to demand more responsible budgets from your legislators and the governor. So I encourage you all, every single one of you, to take advantage of these new initiatives and new access to budget transparency that our office has brought forth. We take our role of being strong fiscal watchdogs incredibly seriously, even if that means that we in state government now have to work even harder. Remember, no matter what the problems, we need to be able to know how bad they are if we ever expect to be able to fix them. And let me just bring this back to yesterday morning, you know, walking my son to school for the first time. We don't live in a fancy neighborhood, but we felt safe walking little David to school. And every family around Chicago and Illinois should feel safe walking their kids to school. I just want to say, I, I was born in Chicago. I love this city. I love my state. The neighborhood I grew up in, it was a tough neighborhood. It didn't always feel safe. It still doesn't. 
but I know what it's like to be a seven-year-old afraid to walk to school. I know what it's like to have overprotective parents who wouldn't let me play outside because it wasn't safe. I know what it's like to have a murder happen in front of my house and have my parents move us out of the neighborhood overnight. I know. And I appreciate that my parents made sacrifices to move my brothers and I into a safer environment. But look what can happen when a kid gets an opportunity and a good education. When I graduated from college, I chose to move back to my old neighborhood and fight to make it better. Good families shouldn't have to leave. And a zip code shouldn't dictate whether a child feels safe walking to school, whether that child lives in Chicago or in Cairo. It has truly been my privilege to fight for people, to stand up to bullies. It's just who I am. It's what my life experiences have shaped me into. When I ran for controller in the middle of this state's worst fiscal crisis, my friends especially, but people who loved me asked, why on God's earth would you want to run for controller now? The job has never been harder. The state's finances have never been in worse shape. And I told them, well, that's exactly why I want to run for controller. Because when I see a problem, I need to fix it. It's not that I even want to fix it. I need to fix it. I dive in. I can't stand on the sidelines. Frankly, I'm allergic to that. And look, you know, anybody can step in when times are good. Uh, I, like, am so not interested in that. You show me an impossible challenge, and I'll show up. We live in a great city. We live in a great state. The greatest city, the greatest state, let's be honest. No matter what cha challenges lie ahead, and there are many, we can overcome them. I'm excited about the future of Chicago. I'm so excited about the future of our great state of Illinois. And I'm so excited and so honored that you made time to come hear me today. And for that, thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, uh, Controller Mendoza. And we do have a few questions, by the way, a few even about your office. Um, first question is from Stella Black. Why do you think the governor is signing all your bills this year when he wouldn't sign them last year? Great question. Thank you, Stella. Um, well, um, I can't say I know what he thinks. But I will say it probably hurt that he got overridden unanimously for the first time in the history of the state of Illinois. And all of my bills did pass with large majorities similar to that first one that was overridden. So my best guess would be that he probably didn't want to go through that embarrassment again. So I'd like to think, though, that he actually thinks it's good policy that the state of Illinois will benefit from, because it is. Thank you. OK, Lawrence Massal, the Civic Federation. The Illinois Constitution requires the governor and general assembly to propose and or pass a balanced budget. Do we need to amend the Constitution to make an actually balanced budget a reality? If not, what would? Great. Well, great question, Lawrence. And here's the question I would pose back is, um, I kind of addressed it a little bit in the speech, was that now that we know that for all of these years, the legislature has been crafting budgets with essentially false numbers. I mean, they're not even remotely accurate to the time period that they're passing a budget in. How could you possibly, even with the best intentions, get to a balanced budget? This is why the Debt Transparency Act is so important in reshaping budgets in the future. Because let's say a year from now, once we have a whole year's worth of fiscal data in hand, I could look as a controller at all of the different 83 state agencies, for example, that report their financials and say, I have an idea of how they spend through their budget. Some agencies might spend most of their money on the first half of the fiscal year. Other agencies might have bigger expenses on the second half of the fiscal year. But I'll actually know whether or not they even manage their, their, their budgets or when they went over their budgets. But at the end of the day, that next fiscal year, we'll be able to see like six months into a fiscal year, this. These guys were only budgeted a billion dollars, let's say, and they're already at $800 million six months into the fiscal year. There's no way they're going to continue to be able to operate at this clip, right? None of this was 
possible for us. We couldn't stop deficit spending in the history of our state before because we didn't even know it was happening until after the fact. Being able to see this financial data on a monthly basis, being able to then craft budgets that make more sense, that are more honest, is going to, I don't know that we need to change the Constitution, we just need to do the job better and we need to be more transparent about how we're getting to those final numbers. And I believe that with more transparency will come more accountability and nobody, no governor moving forward is gonna to want to actually know every month they don't want me reporting every month how much you've been deficit spending, right? So it, you, you have to be, learn better habits because you know everyone's watching now in a way that never was the case before. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, let's just fix it. Make sense? Kinda, sorta? Let's keep talking about it. Yeah, but I, I just feel like you don't, first step is first, right? And I think definitely having this data available has been something that not just something I believe is valuable, but every single state legislator of both parties, even the governor's office used our financials now. They trust our numbers and the markets, more importantly, have really felt that this was a very important step in calming their fears somewhat and that Illinois is taking steps that are moving in the right direction. I think we always do that. Changing constitutions is something that should be done in last case resort. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is, uh, you know, we've had two questions about the office, the state constitution. So it's time to ask the question that I've received about 20 of these already. <laughs> Is there a possibility you might run for mayor? Um, seeing no further questions. Uh, yeah. Um, look, I'm fully focused on the next 62 days. I have an election, I'm running for controller. I've been very inspired and privileged to get to lead people and to fix the state's finances um, in the way that we have, cut the budget uh, bill backlog, the bill backlog I should say, in half in less than a year and a half. I mean, we've done some great things and there's a lot more stuff that we're still working on and 62 more days of full focus. Okay. Sound like a plan? Thank you. If anyone else out there has any questions, just hold them up and our staff will come by and we'll try to answer a few if we can, given our allotment of time. <clears throat> this is from Sheila Weinberg, who's a member of the City Club. Hi, Sheila. You know her. So I'll give her a plug. She's with Truth in Accounting. All right. That's an oxymoron, okay. <laughs> Sorry, Sheila. The annual financial report your office produces every year <clears throat> contains very valuable information. How can we help you get this information into the hands of more people? And how can we get elected officials to use this information when making budgetary decisions? Uh, thank you, Sheila. Great question. Uh, well, our, we are totally revamping. Like I said, our website, for example, is a portal for lots of data and financial data. We make this available. We put pressure on the state agencies to report their financials to us in as uh, quickly a uh, time frame that would allow us to get the report out in a time frame that would actually be valuable to people. Uh, historically, that has not been the case, that the controller's office receives the financial data so late that by the time you're even able to legally publish it, it's really not that useful anymore. And again, without actual accurate data, those reports are pretty worthless at the end of the day. I think having the DTA, the Debt Transparency Act, uh, has really proven to be much more a uh, real-time snapshot of what our financials look like when it comes to budgeting. But I would love to partner with people like Truth in Accounting and all the other civic-minded groups out there who care about numbers and transparency and seeing how we can help each other to help spread the word about these tools that are available to the public. Great, okay, we have a couple more questions here. Um, this is from Outen W. Outen, who's a member of the City Club. He's with the Friendship Center. The fiscal problems in Illinois predate Governor Rauner. If J.B. Pritzker wins in November, <clears throat> what past mistakes do we need to own up to? What principles do we need to stand for in the future to ensure a fair and balanced budget? So yes, I mean, and I made reference to that. that this fiscal situation, um, while Governor Rauner didn't create it, I mean, he inherited a mess, it got monumentally worse in an incredibly short amount of time. So lack of action, uh, you know, being okay with going to warfare over a 736-day budget impasse that was completely unnecessary was not good for the state, its finances, and most importantly, let's keep in mind that while I'm the state's chief fiscal officer, when I see $16.7 billion, I'm not looking at a number on a spreadsheet. Those are people. 
Those are real people. Those are real businesses who have been impacted, devastated over bureaucrats at war, over things that, frankly, half the time don't even make sense. No state, no state, I don't care how rich you are today, could go through a 736-day budget impasse and come out okay. And so the next governor, if that's Mr. Pritzker, who I certainly hope it is, is going to have a really tough job because while it only took two and a half years to really truly tank our state's finances, take us to the brink of junk bond status, it's going to take us a lot more than that to climb out of this mess. But you're gonna need a governor who cares about putting people first, who understands that when you lead the state of Illinois or any office with a moral compass that puts people first, when you end up doing what's morally correct, it's usually what's fiscally sound. And I really believe that we need a governor who cares about people, who's not going to cut autism programs on World Autism Day, who's not going to hide the finances of how they're spending their money from the people, because again, it's not theirs, it's yours. And I do think that there's lots of challenges, like I said, but running the state of Illinois with a moral compass and a good nose for policies that help people and also save the state money in the process is where we need to go. And it's definitely not Bruce Rauner, both from a moral or a business side. Uh, but I do have hope and faith that it will be our next Governor Pritzker. Okay, thank you. We have one last question here and then a comment. Uh, moving forward, this is from Trevor Peterson with the Chicago Children's Advocacy Center. Yay, they're great. Moving forward. What are the three to five most important things the public should demand transparency on from your office? Wow, that's a good question. I don't know. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on that. We've been um, really kind of jumping uh, backwards trying to figure out like what are the most valuable tools, right? Transparency for the sake of transparency, if it doesn't mean anything or if it's hard to access information, doesn't really help. We felt that given the 736 day budget impasse, the fact that my job is to manage the state's finances and put critical needs first, but knowing that I'm not even able to see who's suffering where and how long they've been suffering, like those were the things that were absolutely critical for us to shine some light on so that we could, like sunlight, disinfect what was happening in Springfield. But there's always ways that we can improve on uh, financial accountability to the public. We're interested in hearing from you, right? I think we have a lot of smart people working in our office who've championed fiscal transparency in a way that's never happened before in this office at a state level. But really, my job is to be an open book for you. So if you are needing information that we're not giving you yet, I want to know about it, and we'll figure out how we make that available to you. We're here for you. Okay, terrific. Let's give uh, Comptroller Mendoza a big round of applause.